All right. Good uh, good morning from uh, Coffs Harbour in New South Wales and uh, afternoon if you're in the States. And uh, I noticed on the chat there we've got uh, a few people from Jason in New York. Um, have we got sound now? Sound on, we're saying. Kind of saying we don't have sound. I think we should. I've just unmuted now. So I was just giving everyone time to log on. Uh, I think we're close to... 80 people uh, live at the moment for our 10 common tourniquet mistakes from TACMED. Um, where else we got? Cam, Matt's in Canberra, Joss in Virginia, Sacramento for Gabe, Steve's in Brisbane. Uh, we've got Sejuna in South Australia, Texas, California, Matt's in, uh, in Perth. G'day, Matt. Um, I said, well, you had an England there somewhere as well. I think we had a Greece, Netherlands, Germany, um, Singleton in the Hunter Valley. So hello to everyone and welcome to our first um, first webinar, hopefully first of many webinars that we're going to be doing uh, here at TACMED. So I'll just um, throw the screen over to, to Dan and he can say uh, good morning and then we'll crack into, uh, crack into our webinar. Yeah, morning, guys. Uh, up in, in tropical Queensland here. Welcome from all around the world. Great to see you guys all logging in. So, look, as, as uh, Jez just introduced, this is the first. So, bear with us with any technical glitches and uh, looking forward to a, a good discussion here. It's, it's, we're going to keep it relatively succinct, but just basically touch on the, uh, the main issues that we've come across in our careers with, with regards to arterial tourniquet application, some of the, the errors that we've seen permeating in training uh, around the place. And, and just uh, actually looking at the, the chat there, noticing there's still no sound uh, for a lot of people there, but some are getting it, which, which makes me wonder whether it's, it's uh, at people's individual ends. I'm not sure if, uh, Jez, anything we can do there to improve things? Uh... I'm not sure. I'm try clicking on the video screen. Dave's saying. I suppose let's um, sound. Don't sound. Sounds okay for me. Sounds good in Perth. Matt saying so. Um, it just could be depends on maybe some people's internet connection there, Dan and uh, and where they where they are. Uh, it also could be the even on crappy African internet, Dave saying. So I've got sound in California. Um, so I think we're good in most places. So it could be maybe someone's people's internet connections um, got clear. So oh, I think we uh, we get into it, Dan. What do you uh, what do you think? Yeah, let's kick off so that we can get people, people have to head off to work. We can get this done and get people out the door. Or to bed for some people, I suppose. Yeah. All right. So we should, um, just changing over now, the screen, hopefully. Should have our 10 common tourniquet mistakes by myself, Jeremy Holder, and Dan Pronk. You can see that there, Dan. Yep, got it. Beautiful, all good here. All right, so we're going to crack into our uh, presentation now. Hopefully, we're going to we're going to aim for around the forty five minutes. Uh, definitely keep you uh, under an under an hour, um, but hopefully get some uh, some good value out of our uh, out of our presentation here. Uh, we've got a couple of polls throughout just to find out. Uh, find out some things, you know, what tourniquets you're using and your level of clinical ability and whatnot. Um, and if you've got any questions, please, you've got the chat there, most of you worked out, so um, drop us a question. We, we you know, I, I don't think we'll be able to answer all of them, um, but uh, we'll try to get to, to as, many as uh, many as we can, depending on how we're going with time. Um, so we'll start with who we are. Um, Myself, uh, Jeremy Holder. So I'm an ex. Uh, oh, the well, I'm the managing director of uh, of Tacmed Australia. Um, we've I founded the company in 2010. So I think we're about two weeks out from our seventh anniversary of the company. 
ex special operations command platoon medic uh, with deployment um, to Afghanistan. Uh, also, after after military life, uh, became an intensive care paramedic um, in Sydney, Australia, and uh, and so we now we're based in Coffs Harbour in New South Wales, Australia, uh, and we we conduct tactical medicine and emergency medical training all around Australia and uh, and recently recently some international engagements which is uh, which is very exciting uh, for us so that's a little bit about myself um, Dan do you want to tell us a bit about yourself yeah so Dan Bronx my name I, I work as, as the medical director for TACMED Australia in uh, in my civilian capacity now I, I work as a deputy medical superintendent at a, a regional hospital in Australia working primarily out of the emergency department there my previous uh, role in uh, in the army was as a special operations doctor so a regimental medical officer for Australian special operations units in that capacity spent uh, spent a decent amount of time on deployment uh, log logged a, a couple of years in Afghanistan on special operations there and, and got some good exposure a couple of other trips here and there uh, I also as uh, part of my civilian capacity am an instructor for the Australian College of Surgeons early management of severe trauma course awesome awesome so um Dan and myself, we've uh, we've we've both applied uh, tourniquets in anger. Um, I've probably done a couple of dozen in uh, in real life, and uh, probably thousands in in training, but a couple in real life. So I'm going to try this first poll. Um, so, have you ever applied a uh, a tourniquet? In anger or on an actual patient so let's see this that should hopefully pop up on your right there uh, the poll so we've got some going through there that's interesting so far we're at we were close to 50 50 I'll leave that going just for uh, for a little bit more while I uh, I go on to the next slide. So currently we're at about 36% have and 64% said no. So that's uh, that's great. We're quite a quite a good number of people that have applied a tourniquet uh, in anger. All right, so we're going to crack on with our first presentation. And uh, as I said, if you've got um, if you've got any questions, feel free to uh, to pop it in the in the chat there. So Dan, mistake number one. That, uh, that we see um, people make is using tourniquets as the last resort and uh, after all methods um, have failed. Now, I will say that we, um, you know, we don't want to just be placing tourniquets on every single uh, extremity or limb bleed. Uh, in, in most cases, outside of the tactical environment, uh, we still want to assess uh, the bleeding, the wound and the bleeding uh, to work out if it requires a, uh, a a tourniquet, you know most of us from the or most people in the military uh, setting uh, are, are aware of the tactical combat casualty care guidelines, and obviously in care under fire uh, and tactical scenarios, a lot of the time we will use a tourniquet as a primary method of of hemorrhage control. Um, but uh, you know some people will going back to sort of not standard hemorrhage control and pre-hospital setting. Um, they'll apply uh, some direct pressure, um, maybe put on multiple dressings, and then after they've had uh, minutes of uh, um, you know minutes of uncontrolled hemorrhage, they'll then uh, apply a tourniquet. And uh, you know the studies have shown that if we place a tourniquet on prior to the onset of shock, we have a really good survivability rate. Um, you know, studies showed up to sort of 96 versus if we leave a tourniquet on, we place it on as that last resort, um, patient goes into a, uh, a hemorrhagic or a hypovolemic shock, then, uh, you know, you can have survival rates of 4% when you place the tourniquet on uh, after shock. So, um, you know, we want to get these tourniquets on uh, early but again um, 
you know, we can't step outside our guidelines depending on where you are. You know, if you work for a, uh, an EMS service or an ambulance service, then uh, sometimes you have to go through uh, direct pressure and other indirect pressure methods before applying a tourniquet. Um, Dan, we were talking about even as of January last year with the, the recent Australian Resuscitation Council guidelines that uh, they're, they're still recommending that it's a, a last resort. What's your, uh, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, certainly. It's And it's interesting looking at that poll with about 60% of the audience having never applied a tourniquet real time. And, and that's that's understandable. I mean, it's not something that's terribly common outside of the combat environment. And it's hard to know what you should put a tourniquet on and what you might be able to control with direct pressure unless you've seen a lot of this sort of stuff. The uh, interesting, look, looking at Paul's question there, are these mistakes something uh, you see across the globe or uh, just where we're at? Across the globe, Paul. So both Jez and I have had the opportunity to train and operate with uh, operators from all nationalities in uh, in uh, multiple countries, and we do see these are the recurring themes that we see to to answer that. And Jason, looking at, at your comment there, that's very similar to what we're seeing in Australia. Second line use, so not quite last resort, but if you if you've failed already with other applications of direct pressure or compression dressings, these kind of things, then move on to your tourniquet use. The That's that's a different stance, as Jez mentioned, to the TCCC guidelines, where it's a first intervention. So, I mean, the, the important thing to realise here is it's contextual. If you're in a high threat environment where you don't have time or the light or it's not tactically appropriate to really accurately assess the wound and say, yes, that does need a tourniquet, then you want to apply it straight away. And so, hence, in TCCC, we apply them straight away. In a civilian environment where you might have a bit more of an opportunity to assess a wound, to expose it, you've got better light, you've got stable tactical conditions, then it's, it may be more appropriate to assess it quickly, try something else first, but the point is move it really quickly onto an arterial tourniquet application if you're failing with your other measures. Uh, and some guidance that I used to give to the, the medics who, who I worked with was if you're even thinking tourniquet, then use it. If you're looking at something that's just hosing blood, then then get straight on and, and use a tourniquet. The caveat being if it's amenable to, so on a limb low enough down to get a tourniquet above it. Yeah. But if, you, yeah. if you're thinking it, you should probably use it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, studies have shown they are, uh, they are very safe uh, for sort of up to that two hour period, which I'm, I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, a little bit later on. So a big one from this one is, uh, you know, we don't want you waiting. Uh, to the patients in shock to uh, to apply these tourniquets, um, we, we know the outcomes are uh, not, not very good. All right, Dan, I'm going to hand over to you for mistake uh, number two that we see. So the, for mistake number two, placing the tourniquet too close to the wound. So there's there's been some interesting debate over the years relating to where you should put the tourniquet. We've gone from uh, initially putting it nice and close to the wound uh, to going high and tight, so above the joint. And then we've sort of come back to agreeing that you can put an effective tourniquet quite low down. Now, just to talk more to some of that debate, the the argument for putting a tourniquet closer to the wound is if you're cutting off the arterial blood supply to the, anything distal to that tourniquet is not going to be getting blood, it's not going to be getting oxygen, it's not going to be getting rid of its waste products and you're at risk of damaging that tissue. You're going to damage nerves. Eventually, if you leave it on long enough, you're going to damage the tissue. It'll become non-viable and, uh, in effect, dead tissue. So the argument is that if you've had a lower leg blown off and you put the tourniquet right up in the groin, there's a, a, a good amount of, of viable tissue there that you're cutting the blood supply off to. Now, as you move down the limb, and particularly on both your upper and lower limbs, if you move past the elbow and knee, you've got two bone those joints uh, in your forearm and your lower leg, and the, the artery runs in between them, and it becomes a little bit more hard to compress that artery. In the upper limbs, you can squash that artery straight against the, the one bone in the upper limbs, and you can get good arterial occlusion with your tourniquet relatively easily. It's, uh, it's a little bit harder in the lower limbs, but uh, certainly achievable. So the, the stance that the TCCC committee now takes is to, to put your tourniquet more closer to the wound, so not necessarily high and tight in most contexts, but you, you need to leave a, a distance between the wound and your tourniquet. 
And what they recommend is uh, two to three inches or five to seven centimetres, depending on which uh, system of measure you're using. Now, the the argument for that is you want to leave a decent amount of, of uh, uninjured tissue above the wound for the concern that there might be arterial sever, so damage to the artery, causing the artery to retract. Now, it's not going to ping all the way back up. You're not going. It's not going to retract sort of right up into your groin from a, a thigh wound. But so not, not like the uh, Black Hawk down there, Dan, where, uh, where the medic goes fishing in his uh, femoral artery with the forceps. Well, look, at, I mean, it can, and that's high femoral injuries. That's something that you couldn't tourniquet. That's where we talk about our hemostatic dressings and junctional tourniquets. But, but certainly we, we can see a degree of arterial retraction. Arteries are elastic, uh, uh, elastic um, a piece of tissue, and so it will retract. So a, a good five to seven centimetres or two to three inches above the wound and then put it on, assuming that's not at a joint line uh, is, is where you don't want to put it. The, um, the, the caveat to that is if you're uncertain as to where the highest point of bleeding is, so if there's multiple injuries, say a, a blast type injury where the, the casualty is peppered, or if it's a tactical environment where it's not appropriate or it's low light and you can't get a good assessment of that limb, then put it high and tight, get it right up in the groin, and then as, as soon as you tactically can or can get white light onto it or it's appropriate to do so, have a better assessment of the wound and, and look at potentially revising that. But the, the, the teaching is five to seven centimetres, two to three inches above the wound. Uh, if you can see the wound and there's one clear wound, if it's unclear or there's a tactical environment, high and tight, and then revise it when you can. So I'm going to throw up another poll here, Dan. I'm just going to put this poll live. So where is your go-to placement um, to everyone uh, everyone watching this? And I'm going to put this in a non-tactical context. So just your standard pre-hospital uh, environment, uh, or even if you're just in a civilian context, driving home from work, and a motorcyclist comes off uh, and has an a, uh, arterial bleed uh, in, their, in their lower leg. Are you still going to go high and tight or are you going to go that two to three inches, five to seven metres, five to seven centimetres uh, above the wound? Um, so currently we've sort of got 35% would go high and tight as their go-to placement. Uh, and again, remember I said this is non, non-tax. So uh, we've got about 65% there saying they're going to go uh, just above the wound. So that's... Uh, that's great. And just if I can just uh, respond to Dave's question there, talking about references and that 96 survival, 96% survival rate if TQ used pre-shock. Uh, to talk to that really quickly, there's been a couple of studies, Dave. Uh, the, the first that I'm aware of was done by CRA et al. in 2009, looking at survival rates pre and post hemorrhagic shock. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll send out an email with a bunch of references on it rather than get, uh, get sort of caught up in that at this point but cheers for yeah, that good question yeah we did we talked about that didn't we dan we don't have time I mean, everyone knows that most references are a couple of couple of you know a couple of lines long so uh everything we sort of talk about will um will pop out a reference uh pop, probably in the blog uh in the next uh next few days there so you can look into it um any other questions yeah so not from, from liz there just talking about how long you can leave one in place uh, we're cognizant of time and we might we might move on but but Liz broad broad brush I mean the TCCC committee recommends revise it within two hours the, there's data to suggest six to eight hours before you'll definitely injure a limb but uh, certainly two to three days as a remote medic way too long if you've left it in place over six hours it needs to be removed in a surgical facility where you can monitor the casualty for fear of all the waste products that have built up in that limb getting released into the system particularly potassium and possibly causing cardiac arrest. So revise it as soon as possible, convert it to a, a, a hemostatic. Uh, definitely you will want to try and get it off within two hours. And uh, if, you, if you're looking at two to three days, then, then probably need to have a good hard look at your evac plan there because you, you need to be getting patients to definitive care sooner than that. All right, excellent. So there's some great questions coming through and uh, interesting poll results there as well. I think everyone should be able to see them now as well. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about, here we go, uh, mistake number three, uh, making an improvised tourniquet with a belt or a piece of clothing and, uh, and not using 
a uh, not using a windlass. Um, I, I mean, you know, I suppose being an equipment company, we always, I suppose we're a little bit biased given our backgrounds and being an equipment company that, uh, you know, tourniquets, commercial tourniquets and, and our preferences are certainly the cat tourniquet and the, uh, and the soft T wide um, tourniquet. So they're our, our two preferences and, and they're quite um, affordable these days. So they're quite small, they're lightweight. There's not too many... I don't see there's too many excuses to not have them, and certainly a lot of agencies around the world are, should be carrying a commercial tourniquet. But uh, you know, there is certainly occasions where um, you have to make an improvised tourniquet, uh, it, and it's uh, and it's very hard to do off the cuff. Uh, there's a great blog post on our uh, on our website that Dan did a few uh, probably six or so months ago now on making an improvised tourniquet out of items in your car. Um, but again, you know, to make an improvised tourniquet, it needs to have a windlass of uh, of some form to get the you know to get an effective compression um, around the limb and the tissues to occlude that to occlude that artery. Um, I mean, the studies have shown that uh, the you know non windless improvised tourniquets tourniquets have uh, failed to stop bleeding in up to ninety nine percent of their uh, applications versus. Um, Improvised tourniquets with a windlass of some form that uh, that only failed to stop bleeding thirty one percent of the time. Um, you know, I can't. I don't know too many methods of making an improvised tourniquet with a belt, um, and, and and it being effective. Um, same with clothing. You can make an improvised tourniquet out of clothing or out of a triangle of bandage, but again, it's a, it's about using a windlass to get that uh, to get that. Um, compression um take anything away from those first responders and uh bystanders at the boston marathon bombing because uh that would have uh no doubt been a horrendous situation and had minimal uh, equipment there but uh there's uh some studies not studies but a paper that was that was done soon after in 2015 that uh that showed there's 27 tourniquets applied and all of those were improvised none of those were commercial tourniquets there was a, i believe a journalist photograph of a cat tourniquet in situ but there's no documentation on who applied it or where it uh, where it come from i don't think boston ems had a uh, had cat tourniquets at that uh, instant they're using a rubber tube uh sort of tourniquet which is still technically improvised um one of the trauma hospitals that received six of those tourniquet patients um, documented that, that none of those uh, had a windlass and uh, none of those tourniquets uh, were effective. All six of the improvised were ineffective. And uh, there was uh, talk that, you know, in some of the other hospitals uh, surrounding, uh, they also had, uh, had ineffective improvised tourniquets applied. So... The big one from this, the takeaway, is that uh, if you are going to use uh, an improvised tourniquet, then uh, you know you need to put a windlass of of some form, uh, whether it's um, you know trauma shears. Um, yeah, you know, Dan, when you did that blog, you used the uh, was it the wheel brace from your from your car as the, yeah, as the windlass jack, jack handle? Yep. Something rigid. There's a, there's actually a, a good study, and we'll we'll punch it out in the email. Looking at what works as a windlass, and there's things as diverse as chopsticks that will actually work yeah. for, for windlasses. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, you happen to have happen to have a few chopsticks in your pocket, yeah. and uh, well, <laughs> it provides tourniquet. Uh, so Matt O'Shea is uh, he's asked our thoughts on the uh, on the SWAT T um, tourniquet. Um, I haven't got a great deal of experience with uh, with the SWAT T itself, um, Matt. But uh, I've used similar Eshmark type bandages that uh, you know they've been used for. Yeah, Eshmark type bandages have been used for I think close to a hundred hundred years, and the SWAT T is very similar to a to an Eshmark um, bandage. It has its limitations again that you know you're unraveling a uh, you're unraveling a rubber rubber tape essentially so if your hands are covered in blood again it can be slippery 
uh, if it's wet, if it completely unravels, they are very difficult to apply. Um, very difficult to apply if it unravels out of its roll. Um, again, if you don't do it tight enough the first time and it's a venous tourniquet, then uh, you know you can increase the amount of bleeding, which we'll talk about later. And you'd need to completely undo all those wraps around the limb and then reapply it. So unlike a windless tourniquet where you can just tighten it, just do another half turn or another turn on the on the windless, you can't do that with a uh, with a um, with a rubber with a rubber tourniquet. Um, Fulton's saying the SWAT T is approved by the Coalition of Teachers of C. That's news to me, but um, I'd love to see that uh, see that reference. Dan, any thoughts on the SWAT T or any other rubber type tourniquets? Oh, I might just rather than get bogged down in that, we're coming up the half hour mark. So, so might uh, there, certainly, the, I guess my stance here is there's there's a whole range of appropriate devices to use as a tourniquet. There's some that the Committee on TCCC recommends, some that aren't yet recommended by the COT C, but may be effective. And then as we've demonstrated in our blog, you can you can make an improvised tourniquet. That, so I don't think we need to get bogged yeah, down in yeah. specific brands. It's the concept and that is getting a tight band and then getting a, a, a windlass. And just to add to the point here before we move on, the it's interesting looking at improvised tourniquets, it's uh, even in the, in the setting, there's a, a, an article looking at the response to the uh, mass casualty uh, terrorist attacks ar uh, around Paris uh, that, uh, that occurred. And, and they made the comment that the first responders there, despite being equipped with commercial tourniquets, were overwhelmed by the amount of casualties requiring arterial tourniquets, and they had to improvise. So even, even the uh, scenario where you do have the kit, you're not caught out with nothing, uh, you, you might find yourself in a situation where you need to improvise and, and that's where we need to make sure you're using a windlass. And Jez has already mentioned that if you're putting, a say, a belt on and you don't tighten it to occlude the artery, but you do tighten it tight enough to occlude the venous system, you cut off the veins, then blood can't get out of the limb, but it can still get into the limb. And that worsens prognosis. Uh, one last yeah. thing before we move on, Aaron and, and David, I, I like the comment on the ASPAT and that would work perfectly. You could both cause the injury and treat it with that device. So <laughs> that's, uh, I like it. All righty, no, shall we move on? Definitely, definitely. And uh, you know, as we know, our, our law enforcement brethren are often the first, uh, the first people, uh, apart from the bystanders, they're the first people on scene uh, a lot of the time. So they are doing a lot of these initial um, tourniquet applications. Um, all right, so mistake number three that we see, Dan, is uh, not dressing the wound after we apply a tourniquet. So I'll hand over to you for this one. Yep, so number four, we're up to here. So look, dressing the wound, and, and this is this is one where this, once again, needs to be taken in context. So the, it's the timing that's crucial as to when you dress the wound. So what we're doing when we're applying a tourniquet is we're cutting off the blood supply to the arterial blood supply to everything distal to that tourniquet. So we use this, as everyone in the audience is aware, if someone's bleeding arterially, we want to cut that off and stop them leaking blood. Now, certainly you do want to come back and dress that wound after you've applied a tourniquet. There's a couple of reasons for that. So the, the, the first priority is to cut off that blood supply. That's what your tourniquet does. So it's in, in terms of when you look at, say, your uh, primary response acronym, and Stuart's just mentioned it there, the dressing is in C of March. Spot on, mate. Thanks, you've done my job for me there. So, so the M is your massive hemorrhage, and that's where you put your tourniquet on. The, once you start talking about dressing the wounds, that's when you're coming back to the C. Now, you, you, can, you dress the wounds for a variety of reasons. One is that you, you want to try and keep the blood in that limb. Now, that's not important to the person at the time after you've put an a, a arterial tourniquet on because that blood can't get back into their circulation. It's useless to them at that point. But at some point, you're going to look to revise that tourniquet. You might trans, uh, change it to a, uh, a hemostatic dressing, take the tourniquet off. And so every, every drop of blood you can keep in that limb might be useful to the casualty down the track. The, uh, the, the second thing is, it, apart from anything else, it, it will continue to ooze a, a venous bleed if you have an effective arterial tourniquet on. So you've got biological hazard just leaking out of your casualty. And if you want to evacuate them, it just makes it cleaner. That's not a life-saving uh, thing. That's something that you come back to when you've got the time and when it's safe to do so. Uh, the other thing that you need to consider 
is if there's been a traumatic amputation and a, a bone has been uh, has been severed, particularly the long bones, the thighs, the humerus, you you will continue to leak blood through the bone marrow. Now, most of the audience are aware that we can we can the blood marrow has got an excellent blood supply, and the the reason we know that we can use intraosseous to drill into it and use it just like you would a large bore drip. So, think of it in that context. The bone marrow is getting a lot of blood through it. If you've had a blast injury, for example, or a motorbike accident, and the limbs come off and the bone is severed, it's going to continue to bleed significantly through that marrow. And arterial tourniquet, when you think about what it does, it compresses the artery against the bone. It's going to do nothing to stop marrow bleeding. So that's another reason why you want to put a, a nice, firm pressure dressing onto a, a stump for a traumatic amputation. The, um, and the other reasons we spoke of, but... But uh, once again, coming back to Stuart's point in the comments there, it is, it is in the C of the march that you would do that. So arterial tourniquet straight away in your massive hemorrhage, sort out your airway, check your breathing, make sure there's no tension, your methoraces, any issues there. And then when you come on to C, get back and dress that stump or dress that wound uh, when, you, when you can. And then you reassess your tourniquet when it's tactically appropriate to do so or practical to do so. And it may just be that you can loosen the tourniquet and, and convert it to a pressure dressing. Excellent. Um, I haven't really got anything to, to add on that one, Dan, so we might move on to uh, mistake number five. There's no sort of further questions on, on that point. So technology, here we go, five. So something that we see is not removing all the slack from the tourniquet uh, prior to... Uh, tensioning or turning the uh, the windlass, and you know I think most people that have played around with tourniquets or 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 put them on, um, they would see, um, you know, they'd see that if if you don't take out all that slack, and they even say in uh, in the teachers of guidelines that you need to take out as much slack as possible. So if you can still place three fingers between the tourniquet and the limb then you haven't removed uh, enough slack. So all of these, both the soft T and the, uh, and the um, cap tourniquet, and even most other uh, commercially available arterial tourniquets, there's only so much uh, material. So when you turn that windlass, uh, there's only so much material before you run out of room there to, to turn. So if you don't remove that slack, it's just not going to uh, provide the uh, the required amount of um, pressure to compress that artery and uh, and stop the um, stop the bleeding. So um, you know there've been reports um, of a lot of the tourniquets placed on by medics, so guys who should be trained uh, to quite a high standard that uh, they had patients come into. Um, field surgical teams and sort of between, you know, up to almost 10% of those um, were shown to have been ineffective due to having slack. And, uh, you know, it's easy to put on those retrospective glasses, isn't it? You know, uh, a lot of the time the circumstances that they um, that they place them on um, could be in a very high threat, uh, high adrenaline situation. So, um, you know, it's easy to, to look back at a... At a at a case sheet or a, a patient healthcare record, and and uh, and make these critiques, but uh, we do know that unless you place on that, unless you take out all of that slack from the tourniquet, um, that you know it's just not going to be uh, as effective. It can be uh, you can require up to sort of three times the amount of turns to get the required pressure, um, unless you uh, unless you take that uh, slack. Stuart brings up a uh, a very good point: is that uh, Certainly with the soft tea tourniquet, one of its downsides is as it comes uh, commercially packed, it's quite large, uh, it's quite thick, so it's, it's harder to put in pouches or carry in your pocket or in your medical kit. So a lot of people have been doing a flat fold uh, packaging. A couple of ways you can see uh, that flat fold, I think ITS, uh, Tactical in the States, and then, uh, and then also um, the Tango Mike in UK, they, they do a different flat fold. Uh, but you do need to cause a little bit of slack in the windlass bar to be able to get that flat fold. So it's important that prior to applying that, you need to uh, take out that slack um, from the soft tea tourniquet. And maybe next time we do this uh, this sort of webinar, Dan, we might have to do a, a little video 
that uh, that'll just explain this probably a lot better than I'm articulating it. Um, but we know that you know you do need to take out all that slack. You need to make it as tight as possible uh, when applying those. So both with the cat and the soft tea, I'll grasp the windlass uh, and then I'll pull uh, as much of that tail of the tourniquet as I can uh, and cinch it up as tight as possible before starting to uh, before starting to windlass. Um, so that's that's mistake five slack, and it is one of the most common. Uh, mistakes we we probably see is not taking up just really wanting to start turning that windlass uh, a little bit too early um, anything more on that one Dan no I think you've pretty much covered it the just looking at a couple of the questions there so Aaron looking at the tactical environment is it still tourniquets and airways and then sort the rest pending the threat analysis yeah look certainly I mean they're your priorities if you I encourage you to have a good look at the the committee on TCCC guidelines and it, it talks you through what's appropriate at what stage in the uh, care under fire, tactical field care, these kind of things. But, and, and then that's their guidelines. I mean, it's a judgment call, but certainly your, your massive hemorrhage and your airway, are your first two priorities, they're the things that are gonna kill you first. And, and like you say, sort the rest, pending the threat analysis. You, you start to get into the fine print uh, after that. But yeah, so the TCCC guidelines are a really good guidance there. I'm sure, I'm sure you're aware of them. If you're not, uh, Google it and, and it's, uh, it'll give you some uh, answers there. Demetrius, uh, putting tourniquets on heavy venous bleeding, uh, is it ineffective? No, it's not ineffective. And certainly there's a lot of tourniquets that end up on heavy venous bleeds in the tactical environment. And that's the scenario where you're looking at a wound, it's hosing blood, you think, oh, maybe I should, so you do. And then they can revise that at the next level of care. Or if, uh, if you've got a, a combat medic or when you get in an environment where you can look at it closer and then work out, now, hang on a sec, this is venous, it's dark blood, it's oozing out, it's not pulsatile. I'm going to convert that to a, uh, to a pressure dressing, hemostatic dressing if required. And a tourniquet, an arterial tourniquet will work in venous bleeding. The reason being that you're cutting off the blood flow into the limb. And so therefore you're cutting off the, the venous supply. So you're cutting off the blood supply. There's no, so eventually the venous blood will leak out, but there's no more coming into the, into the wound to leak out. So an arterial tourniquet will stop heavy venous bleeding, but it's not an appropriate, uh, tourniqueting a venous bleed is not technically appropriate. Yeah, great. All right, so we're going to, uh, I know I'm <coughs> cognizant of time, Steve's already got to go due to work, but uh, so let's move on to mistake number six. So not securing a uh, tourniquet appropriately, Dan. Yeah, so look, I mean, the, the biggest point that I wanted to make on this or that we wanted to make uh, on discussing it is probably relates to the, in terms of commercial tourniquets, the cat tourniquet. And, and in terms of uh, improvised tourniquets, it's really tough to secure an improvised tourniquet effectively is the truth. And there's so many variables uh, involving what kit you've used, what you're tying it off with, the, the environment that, that that one's, we won't touch on, on the improvised too much. It may be that if the situation dictates, you're stuck there just holding the windlass tight until a higher level of care can arrive. I mean, that may not be tactically appropriate, but the point being, you've got to secure that thing. With the commercially available stuff, the, I've seen a failure uh, with a cat. Uh, actually, I've seen it many times in training. I've seen it once real time where the, with the cat tourniquet, because it, uh, now we single loop it and the newer generations of cats don't have the opportunity to double buckle it, because <clears throat> it was it was proven uh, not required. The when you just tighten up the strap before you've tightened the windlass, there, it's just hanging on its velcro. And even after you've tightened the windlass, it's still hanging on that velcro. And if you pull the tail of that velcro open, if it's not secured properly, you're going to lose all the tension on your tourniquet. It's going to become uh, ineffective and fail. Now, the it might sound that that's that's a, a tough thing to have happen and, and something that wouldn't happen, but in the heat of the moment, when you've tourniqueted someone, you've tied it off, you're then looking to evacuate them, be that by a civilian platform or in the military context, maybe AME. You've got a space blanket on them. Often, often you can't see that wound. You move them around a few times. People are bumping by them. There's a lot going on. Uh, there's lots of Velcro on military uniforms that can catch the tail of a, of a cat. And that, that cat tourniquet can get pulled. Uh, the Velcro strap, the loose end, can get pulled open. You lose all your tension. Tourniquet fails. So with the cats, it's critically important to take the time to loop that Velcro all the way around, put it through the little cup catch mechanism that holds the windlass, 
and then pull the retaining Velcro strap over the top of it. And that's going to significantly reduce the, the possibility of that tourniquet failing. Yeah, I've also seen, you know, due to that, uh, I haven't seen a cat in anger fail with the Velcro. But I've certainly seen it uh, in training. Um, you know, I've heard of guys that will get a uh, essentially their duct tape. So after they uh, apply the tourniquet, they uh, it's more so the cat with the Velcro. They'll then duct tape uh, around to to mitigate that risk um, of the Velcro coming undone. Now, I think you know I've got two sort of views on this. One, obviously, that'll prevent it from from unwrapping. But uh, you know, if you then need to uh, tighten, retighten that tourniquet uh, after a move, you know, say it becomes ineffective, you start to have rebleeding of the wound, and you've got a bunch of duct tape wrapped around the cat tourniquet. You then need to try and undo that sticky tape, probably with gloves or blood on your hands, and then uh, and then need to undo that tape to retighten. So. Um, I, I guess in that setting, Jez, just to jump in, mate, the, ideally you'd just chuck a second one above it if you've got the yeah. And, then, yeah, and the ability to do so. Yeah, if you've got a second one, definitely, definitely. All right, anything further, Dan, to add to mistake number six? No, mate, let's move on. All right, excellent. Uh, so mistake number seven uh, is applying tourniquets over joints or over items uh, in pockets. Now, obviously, this probably sounds a bit like common sense. Um, you know, you don't apply tourniquet over uh, anything. For our law enforcement uh, people that are that are watching now or uh, carrying tourniquets, you know, these days you've got most most uniforms will have cargo pockets where they keep their uh, they keep their notepads uh, or or any other items like phones and things like that. Obviously, certainly in Australia, a lot of law enforcement are carrying. Are wearing leg holsters um, for their for their firearms, so again makes it that little bit more complex. So uh, we know that if you place a tourniquet over a joint, just due to the bony structure, uh, it's just not going to be effective. Same if you play that apply that tourniquet over something like say a phone or a notebook uh, in a pocket, you're just not going to have that compression uh, around the tissue. Um, to, to stop that bleed. So we definitely want to make sure that we remove everything from uh, from their pockets um, and not place it uh, over the joints. So we've already talked about the uh, the high and tight uh, versus uh, just proximal um, to the to the wound. Um, but you know we will say that you know the T C guidelines state that you know for that initial tourniquet application we are going to place it um, over their clothing or over their uniform. Um, and then later on, uh, we can convert that to, to directly on the skin. We know that with a large amount of uniforms, say winter, uh, where you may be wearing thick clothing, lots of jumpers or pants that, um, it may not be as effective or you may require further, uh, twists to, uh, to have that, uh, effectiveness of the tourniquet. I mean, we see in the photo on the slide there, so that's actually a bomb suit uh, from the law enforcement agency. And there was talk that uh, people, that, you know, you could apply tourniquet or multiple tourniquets or even with a soft tee, join two of them together. And that would occlude um, the blood flow over top of a, uh, a bomb suit. But we, we played around for probably over uh, half an hour 40 minutes um, and we were still having a, uh, a radial pulse on the current generation bomb suits which I believe is the same um, the same suit that they kind of use worldwide uh, it's one of the most sort of common suits so that was both for upper limb and lower limb we couldn't get uh, any effective um, tourniquet to work over a suit uh, with a little bit of knowledge um, and most EOD operators work in pairs, if not more, then, uh, you know, with a little bit of knowledge, you can actually take off a, uh, a bomb suit um, quite quickly. Uh, so you'd be better off, you know, your, your risk versus benefit, you'd be better off just removing that suit as quick as you can and then uh, applying, a, uh, applying a tourniquet. Uh, Dan, anything to add? Yeah, no, good. Good points there. The 
Interestingly, there's, there was recently an article published in the Journal of Special Operations Medicine, JSOM. If, uh, if any in the audience aren't aware of that, have a look at that, JSOM. Yeah, it, it definitely really, get on board with that. Yeah, get a subscription there. It covers a lot of great stuff that's relevant. If you're interested in this audience, then, uh, then, then you'll, you'll be interested in that. Looking at the, at the use with the uh, US uh, Special Forces issue CBRN suit, the Joint Service Lightweight Integrated Suit Technology, and they concluded that you can actually apply it over that. So we, we had a fail over our bomb suit, but you can actually apply it over that CBRN suit. The just touching really quickly on some of the questions before we move on or comments. Phil has noted that uh, first responder with St. John Ambulance don't spend any time teaching tourniquets. That, that, that really uh, frustrates me as an ex-military person working in the civilian setting now. It's on your protocols, so you should know how to use it. And it's, it's that old mentality of tourniquets are bad that's unfortunately still uh, still in the in the system in the civilian system we we're just not learning so look it's uh, push for it as best you can mate it's uh, and, and stress the point that it's on the the resuscitation council guidelines to use tourniquets albeit as a secondary uh, hemorrhage control but you you should know how to use it you should carry them chris recently had a windless break on a cat no longer able to tension it you're right mate that's a throwaway item that that does happen shouldn't happen as much with the newer generation the thicker windlasses the soft tees have got the, the aircraft aluminium windlass as seen in the picture in front of you there. They're not gonna fail in that manner. Sarah, yes, that's uh, we do prefer soft over cat for that reason. The, um, Ken so the, the seventh, as you said, Dan, the seventh generation cat, I mean, it's it's still a, a phenomenal uh, tourniquet and uh, one we, we certainly still recommend. And the seventh gen, they uh, those windlasses are significantly uh, beefier than the uh, than the sixth generation tourniquets. I think there's a photo coming up later that'll that'll yeah. show yeah, show yeah. how how effective or, you know the the change they've made in that. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. Uh, just really quickly, Folk. Yep, blood pressure cuff. Uh, you, you certainly with BP cuff is is a great way of uh, using to occlude arterial pressure. I mean, when we're taking a blood pressure, that's exactly what we're doing with the cuff. We're pumping it up until it occludes the artery and then we release it and we listen for that rush of the systolic, the turbulent flow coming through the artery again. So a BP cuff works as an arterial tourniquet, yes. The, um, we always want to apply a second tourniquet above if possible. If it's too high up and it's getting into the axilla or the groin, you need to think about converting that into a, a hemostatic dressing or a junctional tourniquet if you've uh, got access to one. Cam, yep, use tourniquets on dogs. Uh, generally, the assessment, we did a lot of training with dogs. We worked a lot with combat assault dogs overseas and they got shot and, uh, and injured regularly. The, the uh, arteries in the limbs of dogs won't bleed to the same extent as they will in humans. And the assessment that we got by, from the specialist uh, US uh, SOCOM vet was that they're not required and that a pressure dressing will work uh, as opposed to a tourniquet. It's tough to get a human tourniquet around a dog limb. It just doesn't doesn't work well because they're too uh, too skinny. So look, we might we might move on from there just to to keep the uh, yeah, thing yeah. flowing. Yep, no worries. Definitely some good questions coming in. And then while we um, you know while we move on to the uh, um, next slide, Dan, I'm just going to throw up another. Uh, Another poll there, you know, I'd be interested, you know, we've got 100 people um, watching us now. It'd be interesting to find out what their preferred, uh, what their preferred tourniquet is. So I'll just throw that up there now while we uh, move on to the, um, while we move on to the next slide, um, which is mistake uh, number eight, not applying <coughs> the, uh, the tourniquet horizontal. Dan? Yeah, uh, just having a quick look at that poll. So plenty of uh, plenty of, of cat lovers out there. It might be the the access to the cat. It's certainly one of the tried and tested ones. Soft tee wide. Yes, that's my personal tourniquet of choice. Love it. A little bit more expensive, but uh, certainly I think the the money's well spent. The uh, oh yeah, starting to swing in the balance. But certainly cats and soft tees, unsurprisingly, are, are dominating that poll there. And then a couple of votes for the rat and some others there. But as I said before. I, I try not to get too bogged down into the specifics of what's good and what's not. It's the concept and, and, and correct application is uh, is going to be the, the key here. Definitely. The, definitely. So mistake number eight, not applying the tourniquet horizontally. 
Now, the, in that image there, it demonstrates that that, uh, that tourniquet is higher on the outside of the leg than it is on the inside of the leg. And that's, that's something, obviously, the natural contours of, of the upper leg particularly are going to make you want to do that. If you're putting a tourniquet high and tight, you're going to be tempted to do that because you can, because you can get the outside of the tourniquet a lot higher. The problem with this, and I've seen this one fail on operations, uh, unfortunately resulted in a fatality where a tourniquet was applied uh, on an oblique angle, it was tightened. The, the assessment was it had occluded the artery. That patient, it was at night, it was a, a high, high threat uh, combat environment and uh, certainly not making any judgment. But what ended up happening was that person was, was covered up, they were aeromedically evacuated. When they got to the other end, the tourniquet had loosened completely. It, it hadn't been noticed and that, uh, that patient had re-bled and unfortunately was unsalvageable. Now, the what what happens in this setting is if you look at that picture the 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 distance that you have to cover when you're putting that tourniquet on at a at an oblique angle is larger than the the distance it'll be at when it was horizontal across the limb so what that means is that if that tourniquet gets the opportunity to work its way loose and the assessment was that the uh, this the casualty that i spoke of earlier it was the vibrations of, of flight that had, had made it come loose that the tourniquet is going to naturally want to migrate down on the outside. If that migrates down on the outside to a part of the limb that's a bit narrower, it's no longer tight enough to be occluding the artery. So you, you will be able to achieve arterial occlusion with the tourniquet as it's pictured there. You can crank that thing up tight enough to, to do it, but try and get into the habit of putting them on horizontally straight across the limb, and that way they'll, they'll tighten down, they'll pinch in, and they won't migrate and you, you won't have the opportunity for that tourniquet to make its way down, in effect be looser and lose control of the, uh, of the arterial bleed. Definitely, definitely get them on horizontal. Um, again, yeah, I've seen another one fail due to sort of too high up in the limb and, and on that angle. Um, all right, so let's move on. Uh, so just talking about that poll quickly, so 52%. Uh, for the cat, 43% soft tea, zero for matte. Um, I know in New South Wales, they use the uh, the matte tourniquet uh, there. Uh, rat, got 1%, zero for SWAT tea, and 4% for the others. Had a few listed there, interesting to find out what the, uh, what the other, uh, what the other tourniquets, uh, what the other tourniquets are. All right, so mistake. Uh, number nine is not preparing uh, your equipment or having it uh, readily available. So, uh, I mean, this big one is, and Dan, we were talking about this earlier, that uh, at some stage uh, in uh, in deployments to Afghanistan with the Australian military, they, uh, they recommended, uh, well, it's not recommended, it's the military, they enforced uh, or directed you to have your tourniquets uh, the cat tourniquet is still uh, inside its manufacturing uh, packaging, so still within that plastic. So that way, that way they would um, increase the longevity of the uh, of the device. Um, you know, we and that was, I think, post the study that came out um, in 2011. I think it was Dan there where they tested 166 tourniquets that were exposed to the Afghan environment. Uh, for a, operationally for a six-month period, and they tested them against 166 uh, new or non-exposed uh, tourniquets, and they found that uh, of those 166, 14 of the tourniquets broke um, versus none that were uh, they're essentially new. Um, interestingly, they also um, were only 61% effective. So for the ones that didn't break, only 61% of them uh, were effective versus 91% uh, of the unexposed um, tourniquets. So, uh, we, you know, we do know that the, uh, you know, obviously that the longer it takes you to apply a tourniquet, the, uh, the more bleeding or the more blood loss you are, you're going to have. So anything that can... Uh, you know, decrease the amount of application time operationally is going to make a big difference. So for the law enforcement guys having a, uh, a tourniquet uh, available on their on their uh, load-bearing vest or on their duty belt, 
um, and for medics having uh, you know tourniquets on the outside of your trauma packs or your IFACs uh, to, to decrease the amount of time that it uh, that it takes. So Noel's saying that New Zealand policy is to pre-fold them ready for use, that, and that's and that's great. I mean, certainly for the cats, um, which is a very widely you know issued tourniquet around coalition defence is that uh, you know you want to have that pre-folded so none of the velcro is touching each other uh, if you uh, have it um, if you have it folded with the torn the velcro touching then obviously it's going to stick to itself so you will not be able to open it up you won't just be able to drop it one-handed and it opens up in a loop so you know having that operationally set up same the soft tea having the uh, having the tourniquet uh, pre-folded and possibly even removing those elastic bands so you uh, you can easily deploy them. Uh, having them on the outside of your pack, not buried deep inside your trauma pack, uh, so you are able to get them. So that's something we see. The longer it takes to get it, the more blood loss uh, you're going to have. Um, again, Eric brings up a good point that his cats are in the trunk of his cruiser. Um, you know, this is something that uh, we see quite often down over here, don't we, with some of the, the, some of the police tactical units that they have their IFACs. And you know, obviously, you know, real estate is really important. They're carrying a lot of gear. Uh, you know, the operators are carrying a lot of gear on them. They're carrying radios, they're carrying mags, they're carrying uh, a bunch of gear. So, you know, for them, having an IFAC take up a lot of real estate can be a big deal. So we, we see them place them on the rear of their body armour and so that their oppo would be able to get it off, tear off the IFAC and then throw it to them. Um, but you're just not going to be able to get, if you're, uh, you know, if you get injured and your buddy's going to remain in that fight or, or sort of stop that threat, you're not going to be able to get your IFAC if it's on your back. Um, you know, a lot of the police having their trauma kits in the boot of their car, Eric's spot on. You know, if you're chasing an offender uh, and get injured, you know, you could be 100 or more metres away from your car. How are you going to... How are you going to get it? Um, so it uh, it really needs to be, uh, you know, set up operationally and available. So we talk about the diver's triangle sometimes. Um, so I think uh, uh, Will from Canada, um, he, uh, he, he's he got a good post on, uh, on his blog with the diver's triangle. Same thing, being able to, to get it with both hands. We know that it's a very, very small percentage of people that uh, apply um, a tourniquet to their self single-handed, uh, but it does happen. So being able to reach that tourniquet with both hands is a uh, is an important important thing, and that's why they use that diver's triangle. Um, so Sam's saying a video on the correct fold of the cat. That'll be it. Yeah, no worries. I'll uh, I'll take note of that. We'll definitely get something up on the blog or Facebook or something like that with a with a fold of the uh, a fold of the cat. All right. So anything more, Dan, on on preparing your equipment sort of operationally? Do you want to add? I, I guess this is a point that's that that goes much further than the arterial tourniquet. I mean, this goes for all your kit. And uh, as a, a generalisation, you want to lay your kit out medically with regards to when you're going to need it and think about your march protocol or whatever primary survey or response protocol you're working of and think about laying your kit out with access to the kit in that order and so it's your massive hemorrhage control stuff that you need close to the surface i've seen a couple of comments there talking about having you being having to be able to put it on yourself absolutely that's that's worst case scenario but think of it that way with your tourniquet and so from a tactical uh, perspective we used to protocol uh, dictated that we had a, a arterial tourniquet on the center of our um, a ballistic vest so right in the middle at the front where you could get to it with both arms so that worst case yeah you're putting it on yourself you can do that the but with all your kit medical kits have your tourniquets close to the surface not in the trunk of a car on your body uh the in your pockets in your trauma kit that's accessible think about other things that you might need quickly as well things like your nasopharyngeal airways oral airways decompression needles the stuff that you need in those uh, immediate uh, massive hemorrhage control airway breathing type interventions you don't want to be digging in the bottom of your pack for that kind of stuff quick clot pressure dressings that kind of stuff you want it relatively accessible in external pouches of a kit ideally in a pocket where you can get at it but yeah one one of my uh, bugbears and a discussion I've had many times with tactical police particularly more so than military is having your your individual first aid kit your IFAC strapped to the middle of your back 
And it works on the assumption that the next bloke in the stack is going to be able to pull that off and chuck it at you if you get injured. Now, that's a dangerous assumption because that next person in the stack shouldn't be stopping to help you if you're shot. He should be treading over you to get to the threat and neutralise it. So it, it might be a while before they come back and deal with casualties. So you're really on your own. And in that environment as well, it's going to be a little while before the, the paramedics are going to be let on scene if there's an ongoing tactical uh, threat in a civilian context then the, the paramedic isn't coming in. That's the other argument is that, oh, there'll be, a, there'll be an ambulance on scene. Yeah, there might be. They might be 20 metres away, but that 20 metres may be, uh, you know, might as well be 20 kilometres if they're not allowed inside the cordon. Yeah, so, definitely. I think most, most EM, ambulance or EMS services around the world, um, you know, there is a very limited that will, amount that will go into the hot zone. Uh, you know, we're starting to see more and more with the, as, as agencies are trained up in, sort of active shooter and rescue task force. But, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the ambulance, most paramedics, uh, EMTs, are just not going to be able to come in. So it's, it's going to be up to those uh, up to those operators or those law enforcement um, people to, to sort of apply that buddy aid. All right, so going to move on, Dan, to our 10th, uh, mistake and we will try to keep this we're just blowing out a bit over an hour now so we might just try to keep this one we could probably talk to a whole webinar on on this mistake alone about intermittently releasing the tourniquet to allow for blood flow uh, back to the tissue but I'll hand over to you Dan to, uh, to talk a little bit more on this yeah certainly this this one is one that pops up and and the the theory behind this first of all it's an absolute no no you, you just do not do this the um the the theory behind it is that what you can be doing is is periodically if you've got a tourniquet on for a long period of time you're cutting off all the blood supply to the tissues you're denying them oxygen you're stopping any of the waste products that are building up in that limb from coming back into circulation and they can build up to toxic levels the concept behind loosening your tourniquet is that you can just allow a bit of blood flow in, allow those tissues to get some oxygen, get some waste products out of that limb. Uh, it'll re-bleed a little bit, but then you do it back up again and, and the tissues had a chance. It's like taking a breath, like being underwater, coming up, taking a breath, and then going back down underwater. The the, re the reason it's a, it's a no-no is a, a variety of reasons. If you put the thing on, you put it on for a reason. They're, they're going to bleed out from massive hemorrhage, so you put on an arterial tourniquet. It's a life-saving device. The... the uh, Second reason is if you start loosening off tourniquets, once you've tightened them properly, particularly the cat due to its internal ribbon being a little bit more flimsy than the, the soft tees, you'll stretch that ribbon and then when you loosen it off and go to reapply it, you, you, you're not going to be able to generate the same amount of tension a second time. So even if you did do this successfully and then reapplied it, there's no guarantee that the tourniquet is going to work a second time. Other factors to think about here, uh, a tourniquet, arterial tourniquets hurt. They hurt like buggery. And the, the casualty, if they're conscious, is going to be in a lot of pain. They're on occasion going to, if they don't understand, they're going to be begging you to take that thing off or to, to release it a little bit to give them some blood flow, relieve the pain, basically. So you want to, uh, you want to resist that temptation that the, the casualty might be screaming at you. You, you. you manage the pain within your protocols and within what's appropriate for the casualty's overall state. You give them pain relief if it's available to you. If it's not, you just stick to your, to your guns, leave that tourniquet on, reassure the casualty that it's, it's required, it's life-saving, and get them to a surgical facility as soon as you can. They, they won't thank you at the time, but uh, it's it's life saving. They're, they're gonna they're certainly it's a it's a better option than trying to be kind, loosening it off to ease the pain, and uh, have it fail and they bleed out and have a bad outcome. Certainly, the you do want to you don't want to leave it on long term. I mean, you want to get that thing off as soon as you can. Now, your your options for getting it off are to if you put it on in the care under fire phase or or a, a tactical type environment, then the first opportunity you get. Uh, when it's safe to do so, you want to reassess it. So have a good look at the wound, cut the clothing off, work out if the wound is actually arterial or venous if you can, if you're appropriately trained to do so. Convert your tourniquet to a pressure dressing or a hemostatic dressing at that point if you can. That's the first available time when you might do it. Now, the caveats to that are you never take an arterial tourniquet off if the casualty is in shock. If they're already shocked, then don't take that thing off. That stays on. Get them to definitive care. Uh, if it's if it's not possible for you to monitor the bleed, then you, you don't convert it to a to a, a hemostatic dressing. So don't don't change it to a, 
uh, hemostatic dressing, take the tourniquet off and then have to walk off. Or if you can't keep an eye on that and be sure that you can be there if it rebleeds and put another tourniquet on, then don't remove it. And also, if the limb's been amputated, if the limb is missing, then the tourniquet stays on. You don't try and convert that one to a pressure dressing. You just leave it on, get them to, to surgery. Certainly, the TCCC committee has uh, has has agreed on two hours being the upper limit of when you want to re review your tourniquet. So two hours is a safe window where you're not going to have done permanent damage and uh, you, you're very safe to leave it on for that period of time. So if you're within two hours of getting to a destination medical facility, so in the civilian environments, paramedics, if you put a tourniquet on don't, and you're within two hours of a facility, don't even think about taking it off. Get them to the facility. And certainly, if we had a comment earlier about uh, regional medics and remote working in in, uh, in great distances from from uh, from care, if that thing's been on for more than six hours, don't remove it. You, you, they need to until you can get them to a facility that's got appropriate cardiac monitoring tech, uh, equipment and has got appropriate blood monitoring equipment. So the reason for that being is at the six hour mark after that. There's going to be so many toxic metabolites, particularly potassium, build, built up in that limb that if you release that and all of a sudden allow them back into the body's circulation and that hits the heart, it's likely to put them into cardiac arrest. And so you want to be able to monitor, monitor them appropriately and deal with that as appropriate. So that's, that's the guidance. But certainly intermittently releasing the tourniquet to allow blood flow is an absolute no-no. Yeah, I've got, I mean, I... Uh you know, I can sort of picture it now. It was over 10 years ago. I uh, ha had a, uh, a coalition medic uh, release a tourniquet um, on a paediatric patient, trauma patient uh, from an IED. And uh, as soon as uh, he released that tourniquet, the limbs started to re-bleed. Uh, and, the, and the ped uh, probably just had enough circulating blood volume to keep them quite stable. But as soon as they re-bled, they uh they just crashed and uh and and couldn't be recovered and subsequently died and that was uh just a decision he made on his own uh due to the tourniquet being on for around about the three hour mark by the time they uh by the time they reached us so uh it's just it can be a very it can be a fatal mistake so um it's just something to be a just something to be aware of all right dan so where can uh where can people that's that makes uh, that's Actually, all. Can, can I just sorry, Jess? Uh, looking at yeah, uh, in the darkness situations, how do we know if the tourniquet is in place and has stopped the bleeding? Sarah, spot on. Check the distal pulse. Make sure the blood flow is being stopped. That's that's exactly right. So if you're if you if you can still feel a distal pulse after you've put a tourniquet on, it's not tight enough yet. It hasn't done its job. You need it to be cutting off the artery, and you shouldn't be feeling any pulse distal to that and that's exactly how you can check effectiveness of your tourniquet it should have stopped the the arterial bleeding so the wound shouldn't be bleeding any longer but also there shouldn't be a distal pulse thanks thanks for that sarah sorry jess no, that's all right so that uh that you know we've just been over probably an hour a quarter now so that's uh all 10 of our mistakes and i think dan we could we could talk all day on uh on tourniquets um but where can people find out more dan yeah, so look, we've uh, TACMED's released the the, the ebook that you see in front of you. It's also available in hard copy. So arterial tourniquets, it's it's aimed for any first responder. I mean, we've we've titled it for police officers, law enforcement, other first responders. It is a blow by blow uh, description of it. Starts with the physiology of the the blood supply to limbs. It talks about what we're aiming to achieve with arterial tourniquets. It goes into great depth on everything that we've discussed today. We've kind of touched on the wave tops here. But uh, it, it goes into a lot more detail on all of that and, and then talks about training and, and what have you. It's, it's very heavily referenced. So a lot of the references that we've spoken of today are in this book. Look, thanks for the feedback. A couple of people talking about they've, they bought the book. Thanks for that. But what, what we're aiming to achieve with this is just to, to raise awareness, get people thinking about these tourniquets, get people who are aware of it just to, to think of the finer detail of it, which is the other objective of, well, the main objective of this webinar. And, and just based on what we've seen over the years with cumulatively in the TACMED community, uh, you know, dozens of years of, of combat experience using these things in, uh, in, in, uh, in actually combat environments for real-time arterial bleeds and, and trying to get that information across, particularly in this day and age of increased 
uh, transnational terrorist threat. We're seeing these events occur, unfortunately, on the streets of our first world cities. It's, uh, it's coming to Australia. The intelligence uh, organisations are convinced and, and we've got the opportunity here and, uh, and internationally to get ahead of the curve with our civilian response by employing some of these military techniques. So if you've uh, enjoyed this, this, uh, this webinar, then I do encourage you to get on, have a look uh, on the next slide, Jez, if you want to click it over. So if, if you go to that link there, so just tacmedaustralia.com.au, so our website and then forward slash ebook, there's a, there's a page there which has got a, a bit of a blurb. It's got a free chapter from the ebook, so you can get a bit of a feel as to what it's all about. But uh, it's just a, a significant elaboration on everything we've spoken about this morning. Definitely. So, definitely. It, and and definitely. as is as is noted there, we've got it in hard copy. So we've we've got the the uh, the hard copy books and and uh, and if you if you want one of those, just just get get onto us through the uh, through the the. TACMED website, and that's just a bit of a look at it, and uh, we'll get one of those out of you in the post. Yeah, excellent. So, guys, that uh, that brings an end to our to our webinar. Uh, I, I don't know about you, Dan, but I certainly enjoyed uh, the presentation. Hopefully, as our first, I think technically it went all right. I don't think uh, we had too many technical failures, a couple of sound in the start, but um, you know, I hope you learned something uh, from this webinar. Hopefully, we're going to bring you a lot more. Uh, webinars in the future, um, drop us an email at info at tacmedaustralia.com.au if you've got any other ideas on, on webinars or any further questions or feedback from today, uh, we'd really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a special operations medic, a police officer, a, you know, paramedic EMT, or you're just driving in your car, you know, full driving, camping, on the way to work. Uh, it doesn't matter what tourniquet, you carry, it doesn't matter who you are, we just, uh, we really encourage that uh, people carry a tourniquet and uh, not be afraid to uh, to use them. So uh, from me, thank you very much. Dan, you want to sign off? Yeah, absolutely. Look, just wanted to say thanks to everyone who's, uh, who's attended this webinar. Really appreciate your support, but more so the fact that you're attending this webinar tells me that you're the sort of person who might be in a position to apply a tourniquet. And so you're out there, you're doing the job, you might be in a, a, a high threat environment, and so basically just wanted to say, A, thanks for turning up this morning. TACMED really appreciates your support, but more so thank you for doing what you do. I mean, you guys are on the, the, the front line there saving lives and, and that's a big deal. It's, it is a big deal. It's a big burden to carry, but, uh, but thank you guys. Cheers. Thank you. All right, guys. So we're going uh, to sign off. We're going to sign off there. Um, we thank you again for, uh, for watching. There is going to be a replay of this link, so if some of you uh, had to leave early um, and didn't quite watch all of it, or if uh, some of you want to watch it again, we're going to place up a link uh, at some stage when I work out how, they, uh, how to get it to work. Um, it'll probably be a YouTube thing, uh, I'm led to believe. Uh, but, yeah, we'd appreciate it if you share any replay links to anywhere you think would be interested. So thanks again, and, uh, and have a great week. Catch ya.